Hey guys, welcome to module five. Um, <clears throat> this week we're going to be working on milestone number three, which is your final milestone before your final project. And remember, I had told you that your milestones build upon each other. So we've had milestone one, milestone two, and now we're on milestone three. And so in the end, you're going to combine all of these milestones into one final project. So as a reminder, um, for consistency's sake, um, if you've been using PowerPoint, continue to use PowerPoint. If you're using um, a paper narrative, use paper, uh, your short essays or whatever you wish to call them, a written product, uh, because you, you can't be mixing these uh, assignments together. Uh, it's gonna be confusing and it's gonna be more work for you. So if you are been consistent this will be uh, a very easy transition as you get ready to submit your final project because basically you're going to be incorporating all these milestones together. You're going to be going back and incorporating my comments and suggestions into your final project and you're going to polish your final project so everything flows smoothly and that you address each of the critical elements thoroughly and completely. I will do a short overview of the final project here uh, probably this week or next week so that you'll be able to take a look at that but in the meantime you can most certainly call up the final project grading rubric and take a look at it and see what it, what is expected of you and you will find that uh, most if not all of the critical elements that you're going to be addressing you've already taken care of right so you have no need to reinvent the wheel so this week we're going to be looking at ethics uh, and professionalism in the criminal justice system. And we're going to be looking at it in the context of a couple scenarios, one for a police officer, one for a corrections guard, a prison guard. And then we're going to get back to looking at the constitutional issues associated with conducting a legal search uh, for a police officer and how it might be different for a probation officer. And just want to make sure you understand how um, you know, important it is when police officers conduct a search and when probation officers conduct a search. Uh, again, sometimes they collaborate with each other, um, but um, that's important that we understand that. And then again, you have to select another court case. Um, uh, there are three this week. Again, uh, Ashcroft is one of them, Herring versus U.S., Melendez versus Massachusetts. Uh, the Ashcroft case is um, a little bit complicated. Um, there's a lot of legal issues that popped up in that case. So you can take a look at that one if you want, but I might want to steer you, steer, steer, uh, steer you towards Herring v. U.S. or Melendez Diaz versus Massachusetts. These are all Supreme Court cases. I think the last two are uh, the legal ideas and the impact of law enforcement is easier to follow. Uh, than the Ashcroft case. Right? So that's just my overview of that. Uh, obviously, you can do what you want, um, but there you go. So this week, um, we start out with, with, uh, with the law enforcement scenario that says, while on duty, a uniformed police officer went to a crowded neighborhood deli at lunchtime to buy a sandwich. The deli owner, Ari, told the officer that it was on the house and payment was not necessary. What professional and ethical standards should be in place from the police department to assist this officer in his decision making? And then second part of that is why should they be in, why should they be put in place? So again, you got two things to look at here as you address this specific critical element. And I just want to go back and remind you guys to please make sure you review the assignment guidelines carefully. Um, and if possible, go ahead and use the assignment guidelines as your outline. All right, so we're number three, you'd write something like number three, ethical and professional practices, A, um, the, uh, the um, uniform officer scenario, and then you break it down into, you know, what should the department have in place to help the, the officer with his decision making, um, and then describe what those are, but what an agency can have in place, all right? So use the uh, assignment guidelines if you can as the uh, as an outline. That way, I think you'll find that you do a better job in making sure you address each of the critical elements. All right. So let's get into it this week in terms of the law enforcement scenario. 
Now, the law enforcement scenario and the prison guard scenario uh, all deal with a concept that's common in criminal justice, and that's discretion. Uh, each branch of the criminal justice system is allowed discretion. For example, a police officer has allowed, is allowed to use some discretion, uh, for example, whether or not to write a ticket. A prosecutor can use discretion in terms of what charges to file against somebody. A judge can use discretion in determining what he thinks is the most appropriate sentence. And obviously, correctional officers can use discretion as they determine whether or not to write up an inmate for an institutional violation, such as a smoking in a non-smoking area or something like that. So when we oftentimes when we talk about ethics, we, we talk about discretion. And there are ways that a, a um, organization, such as a law enforcement organization, can limit a police officer's discretion. And we'll talk about those in just a second. But remember, discretion, the defining discretion, discretion is authority to make a decision between two or more choices. So again, to write a ticket or not write a ticket. That is, in essence, discretion. So how does an organization limit an officer's discretion? Um, and so what do we, what do we um, provide as an organization to our employees to make sure that they use their discretion properly and um, what can we offer them so that they can make the right choices? And, and that's a, you know, that's a big part of what we do here is making sure that we provide resources to our employees so that they can make the best decisions possible when confronted with the array of uh, legal issues that um, are part of the job. So there are three primarily code of ethics. And I'll provide you a link to a sample code of ethics you can take a look at in our announcements. The organization will have policies, and they'll have procedures, and they'll have rules, and they'll have regulations. Now, very few jobs don't have some form of procedures, rules, or regulations, or policies. Uh, many don't have code of ethics. But many organizations and companies have these policies and procedures, rules and regulations. So I suspect that wherever you work, whatever you do for a living, even if it's part-time, um, the company you work for has some type of policies in place, procedures in place, rules and regulations. So, um, for example, um, if wherever you work, what are, what's the requirement when you call in sick? Is there a time limit? In other words, do you need to make sure you call like 30 minutes ahead of time? Do you have to have a doctor's excuse? These are all part of these procedures and rules and regulations that occur within an organization. So let's break these down for a little bit. Uh, code of ethics, individual law enforcement agencies have codes or canons of ethics. Uh, International, Association of Chief, International Association of Chiefs of Police has a one that's very common and is used by others. Um, and I provide a copy of that in my announcement this week so you can see what that is all about. And there's also a short video on the code of ethics, all right? So it basically tells you how you're supposed to behave, right? The organization philosophy is we expect our employees to be uh, ethical. We expect our employees to be free of biases, uh, whatever the case may be, all right? These are all covered in things such as code of ethics or maybe some codes or canons that the individual organization may have. Next is policies and procedures. Now, policies are more general than, than procedures, rules, or regulations. So policies are primarily guides to thinking rather than to action. So these are agency values and mission statement. So if your company has a mission statement, that's really a policy. It's sort of, it's sort of to guide you, to guide your thinking. This is how we as a company operate. This is how we want to be perceived. So these are agency values or mission statements. Uh, and then later on in, in this lecture, in part two, um, I give you a sample of a correctional uh, department's mission statement. And it's the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation and what their mission statement is. So that's an example of a policy. Now procedures are more specific than policies. Procedures are guides to action. In other words, they tell you how to do something. Uh, a booking procedure, arrest procedure, uh, what to do with body camera videos at the end of the ship. So today, uh, for transparency reasons and, and an array of other uh, reasons why um, police departments are doing this, uh, officers have body cameras. Well, the question now becomes, what does an officer do with this, these videos at the end of the shift? 
Uh, is an officer allowed to, you know, keep the funny ones for himself? And the odds are no, because that's going to be broken down into the procedures. The procedures are going to tell you what it is that you're supposed to do with this information. And one of them is for you to take a, a funny incident that you captured on your camera and then post it on Facebook or some other social media. That's not the intent of this process. So those kind of things will be outlined in your policies or in your procedures. All right. So remember, um, these are guides to action. These are what you're expected to do under certain circumstances. And organizations such as police departments have uh, a, a lot of procedural issues that they need to take care of for the employees. Okay, so that's another way to help the employees out. Rules and regulations. Uh, rules and regulations are specific managerial guidelines that leave little to no room for discretion. The employee, uh, they either require or prohibit specific behavior on the part of the police employee. Uh, for example, accepting gratuities or requiring an employee to be in court 30 minutes prior to opening of sessions to confer with local prosecutor. These are rules and regulations. So these are mandates or prohibitions to action, right? So these are pretty clear, pretty straightforward. These are things that you must or must not do as part of your overall job. And so we have rules and regulations. Police departments should develop and enunciate policies that give police personnel specific guidance for the common situations requiring exercise of police discretion. So here, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement Administration of Justice is encouraging uh, law enforcement and police departments to develop policies and procedures, rules and regulations in order to guide their employees, all right? So we can help them as they have to evaluate and use levels of police discretion. So again, these are designed to limit a police officer's use of discretion because as an organization, these are areas that we want to limit, right? That way it prevents the employee from getting him or herself into trouble and it offers guidance to the employee. And that's the importance of these things. It offers guidance to the employees so that they know how to behave and what to do under a certain set of circumstances. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the correction scenario because that's part of uh, section number two, but I just want to go back and recap. So, you know, when it talks about in in the assignment guidelines, what professional and ethical standards should be in place from the police department to assist this officer in his decision making, these are the things that are in place. Codes of ethics, policies and procedures, and rules and regulations. These are all in place, all right? These are standards that are in place to help the employee, to assist the employee, as they deal with an array of decision-making processes that occur out, out in the field. Uh, and again, we're talking about a guy who wants to give a police officer a free meal. Okay, how does the officer respond to that? Well, we have, you know, we have rules and regulations that, that deal with gratuities. They're not acceptable, all right? Free coffee shouldn't be acceptable. Um, and so the organization has to deal with these. These are, these are complex things. Uh, they're not easy to resolve some of these uh, the whole idea of a free cup of coffee, for example, um, I'll post an article, a news article that talks about this, and you can get a chance to listen to or read the police chief side of it, and then the um, police association side of it. You know, the free cup of coffee from the association perspective isn't going to take an officer down a slippery slope and all of a sudden make him, make him unethical. Uh, whereas the police chief says that, you know, anything free can, can compromise a uh, uh, police officer's integrity uh, in his decision-making process, okay? So that's it. These are the important parts. This is part one. Um, the next part of my video, I talk about corrections, which is gonna be very similar to law enforcement because they too have code of ethics, policies and procedures, and rules and regulations, all right? So if you can find some of these specific that add something unique to um, your writings, that's great. Um, and, you know, please do some experimenting and doing some individual research. All right, that's it for part one. Thanks guys, and um, good luck on this paper, and I look forward to reading them. Thank you.